Good overnight, and welcome on in to From Day One. The overnight edition, and as you can hear, Art Bell warming up in the wings. For tonight, we go July 30th, 2015, for this episode. His host, I mean his guest, John Dvorak. With his topic of life beyond Earth. So now, between the world's 25 time zones and the great American Southwest, here's Art Bell. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case may be, wherever in the world you are, and that's pretty much the entire world. Welcome to Midnight in the Desert. My name is Art Bell, and uh, let's do what I do in the beginning of all shows, the rules. We have two rules, no bad language, and only one call per show. I should have a third one. Make it interesting when you call. Also, take a big, deep breath before you talk. It helps. I want to thank the usuals, Telos, the company, uh, along with Joe Talbot here in Trump, Nevada, that helps us make all this sound so good. And by the way, I hope it does tonight. We've got thunderstorms all around us. The desert is quaking with electrical activity. My uh, webmaster, Keith Rowland, who has been there forever. Dr. J, my producer, all of you, the Belgab people. The I Love Art Bell people, the or people who love Art Bell. It's so hard to say because it sounds so egotistical. The uh, Midnight in Desert people and all the other chat sites that are popping up all over the place. Um, so Stream Guys, they're great. They get it out to you. LV.net, they get it to me, and that lets me get it to you. And, of course, Peter Everhart, our sales guy. So that's all the thanks, I think. Go to ArtBell.com. Now, why am I telling you to go, go to ArtBell.com? Because we have a photograph there of um, how the White House is going to look about a year after uh, Mr. Trump is elected. <laughs> you might want to take a look at that. Um, oh, by the way, I'm going to be uh, on the Tom Likas show tomorrow. They have invited me to come and be part of... Uh, what, whatever it is they do there, and it's, it's some strange stuff, I guess. So I should fit right in. Um, that'll be fun. That'll be at uh, 4 o'clock Pacific tomorrow. All right, so we've got this barnacle-encrusted wing part, which uh, Boeing is saying, yep, part of a 777. Really could only be part of that 777 because it's the only one that's crashed out there. Can they trace it back and see where it really went down if it went down on the line that they have, that curved line? I don't know. That's a reach, I think, for modeling. Anyway, uh, they also picked up a suitcase today, a suitcase that belonged to perhaps somebody on that ill-fated flight. The mainstream thinking and the mainstream talking head people, what I should say, still think that it was a man-done deal. And it probably was. It made an awful lot of terms. Um, NBC ran a very interesting article on China. 700 successful cyber attacks on the U.S. this last year. Maybe we should get hold of Anonymous. I do have that contact. And they should fight China. They could probably do it. I'm not sure how the NSA is doing, but maybe my friends at Anonymous really could make a difference. And one other story, and then we'll get to our guest who's going to be really something, Dr. Dvorak. Uh, he, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment. A, a swarm of UFOs, and this is on ArtBell2, ArtBell.com. A swarm of UFOs have been caught on camera by many, many, many in Japan's port city of Osaka. The footage, which has been viewed by about 9,000 people now, so it's pretty young. You know, it's, it's uh, released on a Japanese YouTube channel as well. Uh, spherical objects glowing white can be seen flying across the sky in the low-quality video. I'm sorry about that. And some users have speculated they are evidence of ET life. Well, who knows? 
But the Japanese UFO sighting seems uh, eerily similar to one in London, where concert, goer, concert goers there witnessed a bright group of lights overhead in Hyde Park. You know, so these are mass sightings. I mean, it's not like one or two people. This is many, many, many people seeing all this. Coming up in a moment, Dr. John Dvorak. He received his Ph.D. in planetary geophysics from the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. That was followed uh, by working for the U.S. Geological Survey on earthquakes and volcanoes, including the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, other eruptions in Hawaii, Alaska, Italy, Central America, and Indonesia. They, they get big ones. Currently, uh, Dr. Dvorak operates one of the largest telescopes at the summit of Moana Kia in Hawaii. hope I got that right. His professional interests uh, include the question of scientific evidence for life beyond planet Earth and whether the multiverse exists. So this is going to be a lot of fun. So coming up in a moment, Dr. Dvorak. Stay right where you are. You're listening to Midnight in the Desert. And this Midnight in the Desert is filled with lightning, electricity, and lots of storms out there, so you never know. Of nine. This is Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell. Please call the show at 1 952 225 5278. That's 1 952. Call Art. Let me modify that just a little. Make note of the number, please, but don't call it as of yet. Just hang in there. We'll let you know when it's time. Let's go all the way to Hawaii and Dr. Dvorak. Uh, doctor, welcome to uh, Midnight in the Desert. Well, hello, Art. It's great to be here tonight. It's great to have you. Uh, anybody with your credentials is always great to have on the program. And uh, you've got such a wide range of cool stuff you want to talk about. Um, I'm going to start sort of all backwards a little bit and uh, start with the movie San Andreas because I took my family to see that uh, fairly recently. And... You know, I know that it was all CGI. I know it was all fake. But I'm telling you right now, I was on the edge of my seat taking deep breaths through that whole movie. It just absolutely stunned me. The, the It looked so real. Well, I agree with you. I, I, oh. I enjoyed the movie a great deal, too. Really? But one thing that you might be surprised about yeah. is that the ground shaking that they showed in the movie... Yes. It's not nearly as strong as it will actually be. Oh, God. Because if you recall, for example, when they're on top of the dam, 
Yeah. You, you know, I object to that. Uh, can you tell me about that before we move on? I do recall when they were on the dam. I objected to the dam getting slammed right away uh, before it all began in California. Is that likely? Well, it's not likely for the dam to, to, to break up. But what I wanted to point out is, is that during that first earthquake, people are running around. Yes. And the ground is going to shake so, so, so fast that it's impossible to run. You'll, so, you'll actually be, be down on the ground. That have been falling down. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so there, there isn't any possible, um, it's not possible for people to be standing or running around during one of these big earthquakes. So the, the ground is either moving up and down or laterally, or both? Uh, both. And the reason you can't run around is the, is the acceleration is more than 1G. So there are going to be times when you are actually in free fall, and then just a fraction of a second later, you'll be under an acceleration of 2Gs or more. Wow. Um, again, I guess I just object to so many movies of this kind generally destroying Las Vegas or its environs uh, first. And uh, here they did it again, and boy, there and with the dam. Uh, but that, of course, was just the first step. It was the beginning of what became really horrible. Well, that's right. And there are earthquakes out there. There's an, earthquakes, a, an earthquake zone that runs pretty much from Reno to, to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And it can have rather large earthquakes, mm -hmm. not as large as the San Andreas, but you can have magnitude seven plus earthquakes there. But Actually, the latest one was about 1872. Okay, maybe you can look back in records. I live in a little town called Pahrump, Nevada. Uh, we're about 65 miles west of Las Vegas and six miles from the California border. And a few years ago, we had a 7.3 in the desert. And let me tell you, Doctor, I've got a 100-foot radio tower over my house, and I was sure that piece of steel was going to come cutting through the house like a, a knife through hot butter, you know? Right. Uh, it was a big earthquake, really. Right. That, that, that was a Hector Mine earthquake that occurred out in the desert, and that was a magnitude 7 plus earthquake. 7.3. That's right. They said yes. And if it had a... If it had occurred in a place like Reno or Las Vegas or up and down the coast, uh, there would have been major destruction and fatalities. If you sort of look, uh, this is very selfish, but if you look where I am, uh, am I on a big earthquake fault or is it? You're, you're in the zone. I'm in the zone. There's a zone that's known as the Walker Seismic Zone. It's named after... Um, the first Westerner to go in uh, um, Yo Yosemite National Park. It was, of course, it wasn't a park then, but he was the first one to, to see it. And the Walker Seismic Zone is about 600 miles long, about 100 miles wide, and it pretty much runs down the border between California and Nevada, between Reno and Las Vegas. Mm. All right. Well, then here, here's one other selfish question, and then we'll move on. There are two types of dirt in the area where I live. One is what we locally call poof dirt, and it's really soft. It's almost, it's almost like sand. I mean, some people have trouble with houses sinking a little bit into it, or more than a little. And then we have the opposite. Uh, where I live here, we have what's, uh, it's almost like cement below me. Uh, it's called caliche, and it's kind of like rock-like, actually. So if an earthquake did happen here, would I rather be in the sandy place or the rocky place? Oh, you'd much rather be in the rocky place, on the caliche. On the caliche is, a, uh, is an old soil where salts have, have leached into it, and that's what makes it so hard. Uh -huh. And uh, in terms of, of earthquakes, it's better to be on solid ground instead of very loose ground. Got it. All right, now going for a second back to the movie, uh, then, of course, the rest of the movie happened, and there became an earthquake up and down San Andreas, virtually all the way. Um, for all the moviegoers, and I know a lot of people saw this movie, is such a thing even possible, Doctor? Yes. Oh. Um, uh, yes, it is possible. <laughs> I thought you were going to say no. Um, this, is, this is the uh, scenario that people worry about a great deal. 
Mm. Um, to back up a little bit, um, in the last few decades, one of the things we've learned about earthquakes is that they are not random and they don't reoccur like clockwork. Mm. But they, but large earthquakes seem to, seem to come in clusters and they are called earthquake storms. And um, I'd like to turn your attention over to what is probably the most famous earthquake storm. It occurred in Turkey. Um, along a fault, right along the northern edge of Turkey, on the edge of the Black Sea. How long ago? Uh, from 1939 to 1999, wow. that's 60 years, there were 13 major earthquakes. 13. And people have often seen an analogy between that and the San Andreas. And that does get, that, that is a very big, big concern. Uh, a gigantic concern, concern, considering that's like one-sixth of our economy in California. Uh, well, that's right. And so that's 13 major earthquakes in 60 years, or roughly um, about one every four or five years. It's like having... If you recall, well, like the earthquake that you had in 99, the Hector Mine earthquake. Yes. Or the uh, Northridge in 94, mm -hmm. north of Los Angeles. Right. Or the Loma Prieta, also known as the World Series earthquake in 1989. Remember it, yes. You, what happened in Turkey were 13 earthquakes like that or larger. And, uh, and so the San Andreas system... Um, everybody I've ever talked to, including myself, see that as an analogy. So it is, it is possible. Okay, well, San Andreas has been suspiciously silent, quiet. That's right. There, there happens to be a seismic lull right now going on in California. And it's been going on pretty much since the 1906 earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, for example. Is that good or bad? Well, well I mean, it's good immediately as of the now. It's all it's all in one's per perspective about good or bad. It's it's nature, mm -hmm. and right, my philosophy me. is, I I accept nature on its terms, because I, I really don't don't have a choice. First of all, okay. Well, let me reframe the question. It's been yes, it's been so silent, um, I, but somehow under the ground, I have this mental picture of two things pressed up against each other, trying to move, trying harder to move, trying harder to move, and they've been trying for a while now, and then when they do move, they're really going to boogie. Well, that's right. And the two things which are pushing against each other, I think most people are familiar with the tectonic plates. Right. That the outer part of the planet has a dozen or more, more plates that, that are moving very slowly, mm. and uh, where they come together... They're they're uh, they're stuck, and they sort of grind against each other. Right. And the only way of releasing this is by a big earthquake. And so it's inevitable. Um, there's going to be large earthquakes. The question is when. And it just happens to be that during the the great urban expansion in California, you know, from 1920s to the 1970s, sure, that was an extremely quiet period in terms of earthquakes. And and that can't and that can't uh, persist. And we are getting the first signs that it's starting to pick up. Well, when you look around, well, you may go ahead. From about um, 1840, you know, when the when the first uh, 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 records are kept. So from about 1840 to 1906, there were about 15 magnitude five and a half or larger earthquakes in California. That's mm -hmm. 15 over a period of about 70 years. Mm -hmm. The next 70 years, there was only one. Mm -hmm. And in the last 35 years, I think there's been five. And so, so it was really quiet throughout most of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And we are getting an increase um, of magnitude five and a half and larger earthquakes, but we still aren't up to the sevens and eights. And and even worse, I, I guess is, is it oh before again the movie is it what is the largest earthquake possible? Well, the largest one on the planet would be somewhere in the mid nines, like what happened in Japan, right? 
in or happen in Sumatra. Right. Um, and what is going to happen up in, in uh, Washington and Oregon. Mm. But in California, uh, the largest one is about an 8.2. Now, that, that is still a, 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 a huge earthquake that's going to cause a lot of havoc and destruction of fatalities. Particularly if the epicenter is under some n nearly populated area. Uh, that's right. Now, the San Andreas, the only, the only mega city that it goes through is the Bay Area. It goes north of Los Angeles, but there are certainly many splinters of it that run through Los Angeles, like the Hollywood Fault. Right. Um, I mean, if you ever go to Hollywood, everyone stands at Hollywood and Vine. Sure. And you look north, and you see that that uh, round building of, of uh, That's uh, right. uh, Capitol, Capitol Records. Capitol Records, yes. You look beyond that, and Vine Street makes a makes a ramp up. That's the Hollywood fault. Most movies destroy that building, by the way. Uh, that's right. It's a very <laughs> convenient building. I guess it is, and it's a landmark. But it, in, in reality, it's close, huh? A few hundred uh, feet away from the Hollywood fault. Holy moly. Okay. Um, so some something in the 8-plus is possible in these areas, and certainly up in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area, huh? Oh, yes. And not just the San Andreas. People are very concerned about, about the Hayward Fault. That runs from just about San Jose uh, up through Fremont and mm. Oakland. And Actually, Berkeley. There's, a, there's a lot of recent concern about the Hayward. Uh, yes. In fact, there was a felt earthquake there just a few weeks ago. A, did you say a felt earthquake? Yes, it was a magnitude four. Okay. So people people felt the shaking, mm -hmm. but there were, I don't think there was any destruction. But the re the reason people are also concerned about Hayward, the last major earthquake was 1868. Uh, there was about 24,000 people lived on um, in the East Bay. Today, there's always there's over 1.2 million people live in the East Bay. Right. And uh, it, we don't have a movie for people, but if there were a 8.3 or 4 earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, what should we expect? Um, well, during the earthquake, you won't you won't be able to walk around. Um, the best thing when you start feeling the shaking is to get under a desk or something, mm -hmm. and it's just drop and hold on to it, and it's going to shake. For one, two, maybe for three minutes. Uh, that, that'll feel like an eternity. I, the, the one I felt went for about 45 seconds, and I thought it was forever, you know, the 7.3. Well, that's right. If we go back to the World Series earthquake, 1989, I talked to a Stanford professor who felt it, and he said, you know, I'm well-educated. I know everything about earthquakes. But this thing shook for only 12 seconds, and I thought it was an eternity. Right. I thought it was never going to stop. Okay, so, I mean, what people... And then, people and then what happens after it right. is important. Well, yeah, there you go. San Francisco, after something of that magnitude, what's left? Well, there, there'll be no running water. There'll be no electric power. There'll be no transportation. And there'll be no communication with the cell phone. Well, that and just about rips all of it. That, yeah, that rips about all of it. I mean, if all of that is gone, I, that's I, right. And, and and people will have to cope, uh, depending on the areas. If you're in an in an outer area, um, maybe like twenty twenty miles or more, um, things will probably be out for just a few hours. Mm -hmm. If you're down um, in the major shaking, it could be down for weeks. All right. Um, the circle of fire, uh, the ring of fire, whatever you want to call it, there's sure been an awful lot of action on the rest of it. I mean, Japan, uh, off Indonesia, really big stuff. And, you know, you see that begin to happen. Usually it seems like it comes on around, then something happens in South America, and then it seems to come north. Maybe I'm all wrong about that, but it feels like that. And for some reason... A lot of Asia has been really catching it big time, as you know, and uh, the West Coast, not so much. Well, that's right. Um, again, if an earthquake happens in Japan, it doesn't have any immediate effect 
on the west coast of North or South America. Right. But it does have a regional effect, and that's where this concept of earthquake storms come from. So, so there isn't any global increase of activity, but you can have a regional increase of activity that'll last decades, which is pretty much a lifetime. So it could start up, for example, tomorrow in California, and it could keep going for years. Uh, that's right, for decades. As, as another example, um, you, you probably remember what happened in Sumatra. Yes, I do. Well, that was not just an isolated earthquake. That was actually part of an earthquake storm. Sumatra was very quiet in terms of earthquakes for over 100 years. And then in 2001, there was uh, the first magnitude 8 earthquake, and they have now had six. Six in, in uh, 14 years. It, but and, it was horrible. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, tsunami from it was horrible. That's right. And so that's, that's why there's this concern about uh, what, what seismologists call Cascadia, which is the place of, of uh, Washington and Oregon. That, that has been very quiet, very little seismic activity for 200 years. Well, so I have a lot of listeners up in that area right now. What would right, you, and, what and, would you say and so what the concern is, is that there, there will certainly be a large earthquake, but there will probably be a series of large earthquakes. And, they, and once they start, they'll probably go on for a couple decades and then stop again. Would you imagine people saying, I've had enough after about two or three and just moving out of the area? A lot of people do. Uh, yes, they do. I, I had a, good, a very good friend who was in the World Series earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, 89. And after two days of aftershocks, he said, I finally yelled out, stop this. Mm -hmm. When is this going to stop? But remember, on these large earthquakes, th these will be spaced most likely over a period of many years. So it's not like one today and then one next week and another week. Though, though it's possible, mm -hmm. it's more likely it will be spaced out. Still very little comfort after you've just had one. Well, that's right. Um, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and it's a beautiful place, and I would live there with the earthquakes. I oh, have you no would. Problems. You would. Okay, well, that's an endorsement. <laughs> Doctor, hold on. We're at a break point. We'll be right back. This, of course, is midnight in the desert, and it's rocking out there in the desert tonight. And the quaking. Oh, what an overnight. Oh, what a night. Yes. Late December. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft. Witnesses say three people were performing an exorcism in a Texas public park on Thursday morning. Start getting louder and louder and louder. She said she was on the ground and they were standing over her with hands on her, screaming, Satan, I stand that you depart. You couldn't, you know, and it just went on and on and on. That's the reaction from one bystander after what eyewitnesses are calling an exorcism. It has also concerned the local clergyman. Father Dave Hawksley. My overriding thought in that is I hope that the people who are doing it in some level of treaty. He describes exorcism as the removal of an evil spirit through the use of prayer and originates from the gospel of Jesus. The person who they're exercising to the person is getting the care that they need. Police say they were called to the scene, but since it's not illegal to perform an exorcism in a public place, they did not take action. No injuries were reported. A Hillview man has been arrested after he shot down a drone flying over his property. But he's not making any apologies for it. It happened Sunday night at a home in Bullitt County, Kentucky. Hillview police say they were called to the home of a 47-year-old William Meredith after someone complained about a firearm. When they arrived, police say Meredith told them he'd shot down a drone that was flying over his house. The drone was hit mid-air and crashed. Well, we might be a little closer to interplanetary travel after scientists have recently confirmed that an electromagnetic propulsion drive, which is fast enough to get to the moon in four hours, actually works. 
The EM drive was developed by the British inventor Roger Shawyer nearly 15 years ago, but was ridiculed at the time as being scientifically impossible. It produces thrust by using solar power to generate multiple microwaves that move back and forth in an enclosed chamber. This means that until something fails or wears down, theoretically the engine could keep running forever without the need for rocket fuel. The drive, which has been likened to Star Trek's impulse drive, has left scientists scratching their heads because it defies one of the fundamental concepts of physics. The conservation of momentum, which states that if something is propelled forward, something must be pushed in the opposite direction. So the forces inside the chamber should cancel each other out. In recent years, though, NASA has confirmed that they believe it works. And this week, Martin Toshmore, professor and chair for space systems at Dresden University of Technology in Germany, also showed that it does produce thrust. Well, you know how it is. You're swinging a hammer around, having heaps of fun, and you stumble across your very own personal bat cave. Except it's not a bat cave. It's an entire city. While redoing his house in 1963, a man in Nevishir province of Turkey, in an area known as Cappadocia, knocked down a wall. Behind that wall was a tunnel, and behind that tunnel, there was an underground city. What he had stumbled across was one of the many hidden entrances to the ancient underground city of Derinkuyu. This was an entire city carved into the stone below Cappadocia, reaching some 60 meters below. It had 18 levels. It had it all. Residences, churches, food storage, wineries, and even a school. It was designed to house some 20,000 people as well as livestock. It features vents to the surface and several discrete entrances. This all suggests that the city was built as a precaution to protect the people during times of war or natural disaster. Cities like these were used during times of Christian persecution, so religious items would be placed on the lowest levels for protection. The city was also used as a refuge from the Mongolian invasion in the 1300s and up through the 20th century for Christian people fleeing persecution. It was finally abandoned for good in 1923. After its rediscovery, the city opened it to tourists in 1969. Today, about half the city is available to the public. I'm Leo Ashcraft for Dark Matter News. Across the day's divisor, get your ticket to ride by calling 1-952. Call Art, that's 1-952-225-5278. A real wise guy, not that kind, but as in wisdom, Dr. John DeVart is our guest. He talks about, well, we're talking about earthquakes right now. Hold on to your hat. We're going to move on to volcanoes, then telescopes, what can be seen then life beyond Earth. So we've got quite a uh, road to travel this night. Uh, welcome back, Doctor. Oh, yes. Okay, so how does one know if you're at the beginning of an earthquake storm or just uh, a one-off event? Uh, one, one doesn't know. Yeah. That's the unfortunate part. Um, there's, there's no way of knowing if it's the beginning of a storm However, once you get a large earthquake, you, you, you can get a better idea that, that more are going to come in the, very, in the very near future. For example, I mentioned Sumatra. Yes. There's been an earthquake storm going on there since two, 2001, and there's been six major earthquakes. And, they, and, and people have said there'll be at least two more. Now, these next two could easily be... 40 years from now, or they may be occurring now. 
Mm. But people are confident that it's not over. Okay, Doctor, we've got a worldwide audience, so I've got a couple of questions for you that just came in on the computer. I get these things as we go on with the show. Richard in Japan asks, uh, Art, question for your guest. I live in Yokohama, and there are some small earthquakes and volcanic activity happening right now, right here. Could Mount Fuji erupt again? Well, Mount Fuji will certainly erupt again, but what you're seeing now is not an indication of a, of a run-up to, uh, to an eruption of Fuji. Mount, Mount Fuji um, was very active until 1707. And so that's now been over 300 years that it's been quiet. But it, it will erupt again. But, but, what this, but what this listener is feeling and seeing is not a run-up to, to a, a, uh, an eruption. Just a small flurry of quakes? There in the yes. Ocean. Yeah, because part of the problem is there's always this small flurry of earthquakes, and we've never been able to sort out which ones are the actual lead up and which ones are just background. Gotcha. All right. Then there is um, Robert, and he wants to know our ask, please, about the new Madrid Fault for all of us here in the uh, Southwest Missouri area. Uh, yes, one of the largest earthquakes in the history of the United States <laughs> occurred there. In fact, four of them occurred there between 1811 and 1812. Um, we, are, we are pretty much ignorant as to why. We're not sure why such large earthquakes occur in the middle of the continent. Um, I'm, I, I, I just have to plead ignorant. Mm -hmm. No problem, uh, because nobody knows. So if you don't know, it's better to say I don't know. But, right. but again, it's been a long time, right? So again, the, the, the feeling that, you know, it's like the pressure is building. Or is that not a proper way to look at it? Is the pressure always building, or are some areas almost dormant for really, really long periods? Well, the center of the continents are very, very stable. Uh, like in North America, if you go to Canada, those are very stable platforms, and they're known as cratons. But um, almost all the geologic activity occurs on the plate boundaries. So along the west coast of North and South America, um, mm -hmm. Japan, uh, Indonesia, that's where almost all of the geologic activity is going on, earthquakes and volcanoes. Why? Well, that's because of the motion of the tectonic plates. As they, as they, as they, move, as they move across the surface of the earth and we live on a sphere, they, they collide with each other. And it's that collision that's producing the earthquake. So there's really no way, no way to, I know scientists are working at it uh, really hard in California, but there's no way to predict earthquakes, is there? No one has, has predict, predicted an earthquake yet. And that, and we're not sure if it's possible. Um, if I could step back, probably the biggest question in seismology today is exactly what is a big earthquake? Mm meaning is a is a big earthquake like what happened in Japan is it a small earthquake that just got very big or was it a large segment of the of the plate boundary that that moved all together mm. and the physics of that is very different um if it's a matter that that it's a small earthquake that grew big there's lots of small earthquakes all the time, and we, and we will never be able to, to, to predict large earthquakes. But it's if, if it's the other case, that a big earthquake actually starts off different, like a whole sliding, mm -hmm. then it's possible. And, and people are frantically trying, to, trying to, to answer that question because they know that's the key, whether it's even possible to to predict okay maybe this is the wrong way to think of it but on a mountain if you've got a pretty big rock if that rock starts falling down the mountain it can either go down pretty well unmolested and maybe block a road at the bottom or it can hit a million other rocks on the way down and you've got a total landslide on your hands down deep in the earth is is there an equivalent to that i mean you said a small earthquake might cause a big one that's kind of what put that in my head uh, that's exactly right. Oh. If it's a if, if that that's perfect. If if it's a matter that it's a small earthquake that grew big, people refer to that as 
the the cascade model of a large earthquake. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly that. You get a small earthquake that causes more small earthquakes, and they just cascade down, and they produce this, this, this huge one. And so that's one of the models for a large earthquake. But we're not sure if, it, if it's the correct physics yet. Hmm. So conceivably, man is getting pretty powerful now. We could do something that would be powerful enough to cause an earthquake. I, I mean, I am just over the mountain here from where they set off the nuclear weapons. And they were testing them above and then below ground. And I remember being on the air in Las Vegas... And having to warn people, because, boy, I'll tell you, Vegas would rock and roll when they set one of those things off. Oh, right. And one thing about large earthquakes, we don't know what triggers them. And one thing we know about them is that they, they apparently are very hard to start. Uh, for example, one stop. of the largest atomic blasts was in about 1971 or so, up right. in the Aleutians. right. And there was, and it was the equivalent of like a magnitude uh, six earthquake. And there was a, and there was concern, especially in Japan, that this was going to set off a whole series of quakes, but it didn't. And so, this this whole notion of triggering a big earthquake is right at the core of of the science of seismology. And people continue to argue with great passion as to what is the physics of a big earthquake. Indeed. And I mean, you, 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 I could ask, uh, if you were to set off a nuclear weapon with a pretty big yield somewhere on the San Andreas, do you think that has a chance of triggering the whole mess? No. No. Um, it's just not putting enough energy um, in the ground to do that, okay. or the right type of energy. So in I other mean, words, in, uh, even, in, hydro in hydrogen bombs, hydro even hydrogen bombs are small energy compared to a big earthquake. Yeah, it has to do with the way that the that the energy gets put into the earth. Because you know an explosion is sort of like an impulse. An earthquake is like a uh, a sliding. And so if you had a bomb that could actually slide things, it might do it. Let but me tell what you a bomb isn't like that on the physics is very different. I see. All right. Um let me tell you. Your mic is so good, doctor. And I know you're in Hawaii, right? That I hear a bird in the background. Oh uh, yeah, um, the sun <laughs> is just going down, and that's when the birds start to chirp. Oh, I bet it's gorgeous. It's beautiful in Hawaii every day. Well, you know, I I hear that. I I, I very nearly moved uh, recently. I I had this ham radio friend who had this gorgeous property up on a hill, down on the uh, Big Island, and the only thing that stopped me was interesting because it was coming out of the ground. And I'm talking about uh, the volcanic stuff. I forget what they call it. But um, it's actually a pretty severe factor. Depending where on the Big Island you are, it, it fools with air quality. No question about it. Oh, well, that's right. Um, it certainly puts a lot of, a lot of uh, smoke in the air. I think they call it bog. But that's right, bog or <laughs> a, a volcanic uh, fog. Right. Um, and that usually blows with the trade winds, so it blows away from where I am. But it's a beautiful island. The volcanoes are one of the intriguing things. Oh, it's gorgeous. And and there are, are and from my house I can see both Kilauea, which I live on in Mauna Loa, mm -hmm. and I actually saw both of them erupt simultaneously when I was um, uh, in bed one morning. Oh, and that didn't, and it, uh, that it was, didn't move it you away, huh? You didn't move away. Oh, no. If anything, people people uh, come here for eruptions. The eruptions <laughs> are spectacular. <laughs> I've never seen anybody not be, be odd the first time when they see molten rock. Well, I can tell you one who's not odd. I'm married to a Filipina, a Filipina gal, and I lived in the Philippines for a long time. We were in Manila, and we got news that uh, the Mayan volcano was erupting. And I said, come on, hun, let's, let's get in the car and go down there. I want to see this. And I could not get her to budge. I think she's genetically disinclined to go to an erupting volcano. Um, that's, that's the initial uh, response, certainly. And, and the ones in, in the Philippines are, are the ones which explode. 
They do. The ones here in Hawaii are not. Good point. Very good point. Uh, at any rate, I, I could not get her to budge. She, she wasn't going to go, and so we never did end up going. But uh, the mine volcano was going pretty well there for a while, and it was getting scary, and they were beginning to, you know, make people move away and safety areas and all that sort of thing. But I wanted to go. So I guess you're probably very much like me. Uh, you want to see it. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm very intrigued. I, I'm attracted to to the parts of nature which are dynamic. I'm attracted to storms, me earthquakes, too. Oh, me too. Uh, volcanoes. I chased tornadoes. Oh, no, I did earlier. In oh, my you life. did? Oh, heavens, yes. Uh, Amarillo, uh, Texas, a um, friend of mine and I used to get in a little Volkswagen. <laughs> How dumb is uh -huh. that? And we would chase these uh, giant storms all the way sometimes into Oklahoma, take video and sell it to the TV station there in Amarillo. And so I, I love it. I love violent anything. But, you know, I, I married a gal who's somehow got it in her genetic structure to stay away from volcanoes. Can't blame her. Mm -hmm. So I love that kind of thing. So in that, we, we share something. Um, so with regard to earthquake prediction, mm -hmm. it's, it's a no. I mean, there was some guy in California who predicted 98% chance or something like that of one in Northern California and it never came off. Uh, yes, there's there's been a whole series of of uh, people attempting to predict one. All right, so people are failing at predicting. Now, here's the other question: What about animals? Jim Brooklyn um, is famous for watching the newspaper for missing lost animals because they he thinks they run away before earthquakes. Uh, yes, I'm very familiar with Jim Birkeland, ah. but uh, um, no, no one has ever used animals to, to predict earthquakes. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but there's scientific. Mm -hmm. And what I mean about that, in order to have scientific evidence for anything, it has to be consistent. You have to have other supportive evidence for it. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to come up with a, with a mechanism for it. And you have to be able to use it to sort of predict what's going to happen. Mm. And the problem with using animals is that people tell me that their dog, horse, um, cat ran away or they came back or got active or fell asleep. And all that is inconsistent. And, and that's been the, been the fundamental problem with animal predictions. And people have looked at over 100 different species. Um, and there's just is nothing consistent about it. Okay, so really, when, when you boil everything you've said down, uh, there, we just don't understand earthquakes. We don't understand them to the point that we can uh, predict them at all. Fair? Uh, that's right. And we don't even know if the physics of our large earthquakes even, even permit it. For example, sci scientists talk about something being non-deterministic mm -hmm. or... or or, or it is or it is determined. For example, the orbit of the moon is determined. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you when, when an eclipse is going to happen. All that is deterministic. Earthquakes seem to be non-deterministic, which means we may not have any hope of predicting them. I know That's they, just they, the they, physics of it. Right. They've set up lasers looking across mountain ranges and looked for movement. And they've done all these different things. And... So you just can't predict. Uh, it's, it certainly isn't possible today. Hmm. All right. Um, sort of then on to volcanoes. I, I do have a fear of Yellowstone. Yellowstone, um, I've seen predictions of what would happen if Yellowstone blew up. And uh, they're not good at all. Well, let me say I've never met a volcano I didn't like. Even yellow, um, yellow? I, I find them intriguing. Um, the ones at Yellowstone with the boiling pots, the geysers. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. All of and and even looking at, at the debris from the the last major eruptions, all of that, all that is very spectacular. That said, if Yellowstone, if the caldera, boom, blew up, um, what would happen? <laughs> well. Um, the main effect, of course, is the tremendous amount of ash, yes. which will go. Um, 
I don't recall exactly what the maps are, but some, if you're within 50 miles or so, you'll probably have three to four feet of ash. Mm. And even as far as New York, you'll probably have something like a tenth of an inch of ash. Uh, that will certainly raise havoc to transportation and, and, uh, uh, and the produce and, and the farmland and so forth, the economy. Um, but such a thing is extremely unlikely. Good. <laughs> Honestly, good. Now, again, I've got a lot of Northwest listeners. And, of course, you know, they're very concerned about Mount St. Helens with good reason. Right. I was at Mount St. Helens in 1980. You were there? Oh, yes. Oh, my. That's when I, that's when I started my career. I couldn't, I couldn't believe my, my, my great fortune. Uh, well, from our perspective, I understand your statement. Most people would go, oh, really? <laughs> great fortune? Well, it, uh, the eruption was spectacular, and uh, dealing with putting in instruments, uh, uh, standing on the ground as it shakes like jello, um, <laughs> and and just to just to be, well, the, the one that I was close to was not St. Helens. It was one down in Indonesia, just less than a mile away when it blew up, and and that was the the uh, um, the night that my life changed. It was an epiphany to me when I was just within a mile or two. Of, uh, of this volcano exploding, and I had just been in the crater a couple hours earlier. It, yes. it, it was a spectacular sight. You had just been in the crater. Yes, we had just oh. gone in the crater. This was Galunga. <laughs> I doubt if people remember the, that it when it exploded in 1982. Uh, we were actually at the top of a volcano called Merapi, 50 miles away, during its first explosion. Right. And then we we got in Land Rovers and we rushed over there as fast as we could. You, you, were, you do you realize were, you're, you're, you're describing things with a sort of a, um, I, I don't know, a zealot's excitement about how cool it is. Most things that people would move away from, run from. So it's kind well, of interesting to listen to. I understand it. If you could, could promise me one thing. Yes, sir. Don't tell my mother. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> But Have you described these things to your mom? Never. Oh, really? Oh, she said, well, what did you do? I said, well, I had dinner, and, and then we all went to bed. I, I mean, it was just a quiet night, Mom. But anyway. <laughs> all right, we're at a break point, that break point I, I told you about. We'll be right back. Got cut off, didn't it? Let's try it again. In that darkest time between dusk and dawn, from the high desert, it's Art Bell's Midnight in the Desert. Now, here's Art. Oh, well, that'll do, I guess. <laughs> ah, electronics. All right, Dr. Dvorak is my guest, and we're talking about calamitous things, actually. And Yeah, I used to chase tornadoes, and I can't tell you the thrill of seeing... The sky, utterly dark in front of you, big roll cloud coming, the sun peeking out somewhere, and then suddenly a tornado dips down. Now, even the meteorologists on the Weather Channel have a hard time, uh, Doctor, sort of hiding their elation uh, at, at what they're seeing. This baby is amazing. But then, on the other hand, they have to say, but of course it's awful and very dangerous. Get, get in your basements right now. So... People like us, um, it's like riding a fine line, isn't it? 
Well, that's right. And when you feel in your heart, you're, you're very much torn apart because these events are very destructive. Yes. But they're extremely awesome. And uh, if I could tell you, remember there was an uh, earthquake in, in Chile about four years ago. I it do. did a huge amount of destruction. I do. And uh, the wave came across the Pacific. And so I went down uh, to Hilo and stood on a cliff to watch the wave come in. Mm -hmm. But deep in my heart, I had this problem. I was intrigued and safe, and I knew there was hundreds of thousands of people suffering. And they were trapped in rubble. Right. And I, and personally, I, I still have trouble dealing with that between the the elation I have for nature and and the empathy that I feel for these people. Sure. For example, I asked a person who was the head of the earthquake uh, studies for the for the United States Geological Survey. I said, the day you retire. Are you going to be disappointed there hasn't been a tremendous earthquake like 1906 in California? Right. And he turned to me and he said, no, because of all the suffering it's going to cause. He said, I'm, I'm not sure I could actually deal with that. Uh, and yet that's, the, I guess, the job. Um, right? It's a job. I, you, you should be interested in it. It's just hard to temper it uh, so that normal people understand. That's it. Oh, that's right. And people who deal with hurricanes, I've talked to them, and, and they feel the same way. There, there's the, this elation that there's a Category 5 monster out there. But they know that in, in 48 hours, yes. it's going to rip across um, and destroy people's lives. Again, my, my wife's home in the Philippines uh, is just about the bullseye for more typhoons than you can imagine. It's Horrible. Right. In fact, here on this island, there's a there's a tropical storm that's going to become a hurricane tomorrow, oh. and it's projected to run very close to the Hawaiian Islands on Wednesday. Really? And the question is, will it go across the islands or north or south? And um, that's sort of what part of life of what you deal with. Mm -hmm. um, next Thursday, my my house may or may not be here. <laughs> What, how does it look now? I mean, I'm sure you're following the track very carefully. If the track is accurate, does it miss? Well, it's 1,800 miles away. Oh. And so there's a, there's a huge uncertainty. The only thing that is certain right now is that it's, it's, going, to, it's going to grow from a tropical storm into a hurricane, mm -hmm. Category 2, and it will pass close to, to the Hawaiian Islands at the middle of next week. And the cone, I'm sure, at that distance is well over you right now. Uh, on the cone includes me, yes, but it could also be uh, f 500 miles north. Mm -hmm. So, but that's but long ago, I I I just learned you you uh, you accept what's given to you in terms of nature. So Mount St. Helens um, is the fact that it recently, fairly recently, exploded. Uh, does that indicate to you that it's liable to go again? Or exact opposite, that it'll go to sleep for a while? Well, um, a system like that can certainly go dormant for hundreds of years. It, it is very unlikely to have a replay of what happened in 1980. Right. And there's a variety of reasons. Um, and so that's not, if you ask people uh, who, who are involved in hazards of volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest, Mount St. Helens is there. But the bigger concerns are Shasta, Mount Hood, and Mount Rainier. Oh. Mount Hood, um, most of the watershed for Mount Hood, that's the water supply for Portland, Oregon. Right. Uh, Mount Rainier, because of the amount of ice on it, could, could, could produce a lot of mud flows. Mm. And, they, and they can reach the, uh, 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 the, the water, you know, in the southern part of Seattle. And there's hundreds of thousands of people live there. In Shasta, Shasta, there's not as many people, but it could certainly um, produce a lot of destruction. Okay. And so th those are the three which, if you ask about the Pacific Northwest, th those are the ones that people focus on. I see. And with that, we are going to leave Art Bell and John Dvorak for this night. I've also come to a conclusion I'm not going to try to cut out or otherwise make sure YouTube doesn't 
copyright strike music anymore. I'll just have to edit it on the back end. And you'll notice if you have an episode coming up in the future where it's just dead silence for 10 to 30 seconds, that happened. But we will conclude the end of the day here today on From Day One. As always, please make sure you do like, share, and subscribe. Get us to that goal of 50,000 views, 1,000 subscribers. Some boxy sends those nice red boxes we can send to you. And YouTube puts us on the algorithm. Coinbase, Ibotta, and Game.gg. Fill them out. Get your $10 free for the first two and your first 100 credits free for the third. Anytime, day, night, or weekend. Help yourself out and help out the show as well. Until tomorrow, like, share, and subscribe. Be kind to one another. Go ahead and a good time as always to release the Krakens as we march along here from day one. Have a great overnight. Enjoy your night's sleep. We'll see you tomorrow as we march here from day one. Have a great night, everybody.